Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Hélène Langevin. I'm the director of the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's uh, Grand Integrative Medicine Grand Rounds. And uh, our opening presenter uh, is going to be Dr. Don Levy, who is the medical director of the Osher Clinical Center here at the Brigham. Dr. Levy. So today we're, we're inviting you on a journey because this is a a case that's halfway finished, where we've started to work up a patient who's come to, to talk with you as well today. Uh, I have some ideas about what I think is wrong. We have a couple of consultants who might tell me I'm completely off, and you can humiliate me in front of the others. Uh, but we'll see. But we'd ask you all to be thinking and possibly participate. Uh, you may, might even get a chance to ask the patient some questions at the end. And it's a story of gastrointestinal distress, and I think by the end you'll at least be able to answer this one question, probably by the middle. Which of the following at best applies to Ben's symptoms? You can choose all that apply. So you can see what the, dis what the dilemma has been. Uh, ben is, uh, when I met him, is a 27-year-old gentleman living with roommates. He loves things outdoors. I like to talk about the person before the history of present illness. He's a special needs teacher for severely autistic, behaviorally challenged people, and he's working towards an advanced degree at the same time uh, at night, doing, doing school, doesn't smoke, not much drinking. His diet goes back and forth between healthy and not so healthy, sounds familiar, uh, and it's been gluten-free for the last two years. He sleeps pretty well, loves to climb, loves to be outdoors. Uh, his past medical history was notable for anxiety, ADD, uh, it lists celiac disease, a leg injury when he was hiking, and he had mono. His meds are just basically Zoloft, occasional rare Xanax, doesn't take many supplements, family histories, parents have a couple of chronic diseases. Um, in life, his, his, he gives his stress of four to eight, and the source is that work is hard, school is hard, both of them together are even harder. Uh, it's hard to get the things done on time. He's already an anxious person, that doesn't help. Uh, everybody has financial issues. And one of his ways of dealing with stress is deep breathing or climbing. So here's his journey, and this is mostly picked through a chart. And about five years ago, around now, his, at his PCP's office, this was his complaint, gas, bloating, diarrhea, abdominal pain, for over a year. Uh, and it appears to be worse after dairy. Um, a few months later, the next thing that shows up in the chart is celiac lab tests. And for those who know them, that first one, the tissue transglutaminase, IgA, uh, while a person is eating gluten, is a pretty sensitive test to rule in or rule out uh, celiac disease, and his was normal. So is his total IgA, which is confirming that he's not just an IgA deficient person. Later in that year, it took a few months, uh, August 30th was a big day. He was put out and had an upper and lower endoscopy. So he, he, he saw a gastroenterologist at this point, and the colonoscopy was entirely normal, looking for the scary things that doctors like to look for. And he had an upper endoscopy, and this got him into a slight sidetrack because there was a tiny little ulcer seen at the gastrointestinal junction, gastroesophageal junction. This led to, if you can see, another endoscopy a month later and another one two months later. We won't go into it. Everything turned out to be fine, except for Ben, who had now been through three endoscopies uh, in about a month, two months. Now, we're into 2013. Gas, bloating, diarrhea, abdominal pain, still happening now for several years. Another gastroenterologist sees him, takes a really good look, does an upper endoscopy. It's entirely normal. I mean, uh, yeah, an upper endoscopy, that's entirely normal. And he does a duodenal biopsy, and the duodenal biopsy is entirely normal. Important thing to do if you're thinking about celiac disease as a possibility. His diagnosis is irritable bowel syndrome, and he says consider the FODMAP diet. For those of you who don't know what FODMAP is, I do promise to tell you, but I'm going to tease you with it about five more times. I asked Ben, and he was not sure he ever heard the word irritable bowel syndrome. Maybe he did. Definitely didn't hear the word FODMAP diet, but we'll ask that again in a few minutes. It's 2014 now, gas, bloating, diarrhea, abdominal pain. There's a third gastroenterologist who's also his PCP. And in this case, this August 26th uh, office visit, he's had abdominal pain since 09, decided to stop all gluten a few, four months ago, and is feeling a lot better now. Uh, he also just stopped coffee, and that seemed to help. His weight's good. He's been working out. He had hiked the entire Appalachian Trail, one of his a special accomplishments in his life, which I admire, being a hiker. 
I'm not sure I could do that. Um, and this person said to Ben, well, if taking away gluten was that effective, you'd probably have celiac disease. And that stuck. I, do I have that right? That, that you probably have celiac disease because you're so gluten sensitive. Um, so put that in your head for a minute because that's a big diagnosis to be given. Um, summer of 2016 is when I first meet him. That's his past summer. And he comes to tell me that he has celiac disease. Uh, and he has gas, stomach pains, bloating, diarrhea. It's better at the toilet. You get relief. Um, sometimes there's constipation. Sometimes there's nausea. And a lot better, but not all better, since going off gluten a couple of years ago. Um, it's certainly worse with the stress at work. He is, has, to me, one of the most stressful jobs I could think of dealing with severely autistic, behaviorally challenged kids and studying to get an advanced, uh, to get a master's degree at the same time. And as that revs up, things get worse. And he just would like to be able to go about his life without worrying about his stomach all the time. So let's talk about this for a minute. Uh, what is this? What is this? Uh, he's been now told IBS by one person and celiac disease by another. Uh, this is, I love this one, the American College of Gastroenterology uh, in, oh, in 09 came up with a very simplified definition. It's really just abdominal pain or discomfort abnormal bowel habits, three months, good enough. Uh, there are uh, older criteria that I was taught in school long ago, the Rome criteria, you have to have it three months and three days a week, uh, three days a month, et cetera. But some of the older criteria give specific symptoms. That's what people related to the most. There's always improvement with at the toilet and there's always a change in stool. The Manning criteria with the ones, I think the ones I most w remembered, again, pain relieved if, if you can get to a bathroom. Uh, but people report abdominal distension, passing of mucus, incomplete evacuation, incomplete evacuation, often said by folks with this thing called irritable bowel. Clinicians actually think about those things but are really looking for red flags before they continue. And in this case, the red flags, I believe, and Dr. Chan will correct if there's something more, uh, being woken up at night. Ben is woken up at night by these symptoms, but he seems to reproduce what happens in the morning, goes to the toilet, gets some relief, and gets back to bed. He is not all up, up all night with bloody diarrhea and pain, uh, but you can correct me if that's wrong. Um, there's not an unintended weight loss. There's no fever, chills, bleeding, uh, no strong family history of cancer or celiac. Those are things that might make us be a little bit alarmed and look a little deeper and get a, a consult sooner. Because there's this long list, and I guess we're paid to worry about all the things you don't have, and this is some of the things, uh, none of them really fit Ben too well, uh, or some, some of these are possibilities. Um, so in his case, that's now that this past summer, and he certainly has the altered bowel function for more than three months. He's got pain. He also has food intolerances, for sure, gluten. There's something going on with gluten. Um, not lactose, because that had been tested. And maybe it's FODMAPs. It's the second time I've mentioned that. I will tell you what it means. FODMAPs is a group of carbohydrates um, that might be the, a culprit in many people with this kind of problem. He certainly has life stresses. Um, we've already now looked, if you look back, he has had a test for celiac disease in that he had a biopsy of his duodenum while he was eating gluten. And he had a negative tissue transglutaminase test. This said to me, you don't have celiac disease. This was a big revelation. Um, he said, really? Is that really, really true? Because that's not how he's been living for the last couple of years. But I thought possibly a wheat allergy, and so we sent off at least a blood test for an IgE for wheat. It's a hint at least for allergy, maybe not necessarily a food sensitivity, and that was negative. So at this point, the answer to the opening question, I said I think he has irritable bowel syndrome, does not have celiac disease, but he has non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And this might be a good point for a future, for uh, somebody to tell you about our future. And I'll say this again at the end. In November, the forum, we're having one of the world's foremost uh, experts on gluten, Alessio Fasano, as one of our speakers, who will deal with this subject a little more. Because I find this fascinating. What to do with this is controversial. What is non-celiac gluten sensitivity? Am I correct? You just happen to have irritable bowel and the wheat. Well, we'll figure that out. He doesn't seem to have a wheat allergy. 
So irritable bowel syndrome, if you start thinking about it um, from the point of view of integrative medicine, which is part conventional as well, there seems to be food intolerances. Uh, again, the FODMAPs group. Uh, lactose is a possibility for many, as is gluten. There's always the dysmotility, this altered bowel spat. You, you can have spasm, and you, which can lead to diarrhea or constipation, the same condition. Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It is, I think a big one is the disturbed intestinal microbiome. I think that's growing larger and larger, but at the same time, we don't know what that means fully. It seems like we're on the right track, but we don't know what to do about a, quote, disturbed intestinal microbiome. Alternative folks love to talk about leaky gut and intestinal hyperpermeability, which the, our guts are by definition leaky, or we would not get any nutrients into us, but if it's, I guess, too permeable, large proteins and other things come in and cause, causes inflammation, perhaps autoimmune diseases. Very interesting, interesting area to research. And those other things listed there, there's a bunch of things that go along with irritable bowel. And each one of these could be a, a talk on their own. Uh, so our approach to care, uh, which I began to think about with Ben, is this is let's deal with the irritable bowel syndrome. And we're often interested in diet eliminations, challenges. We've already, he's done a lot of eliminating. He's, he's now on a gluten-free diet. He does not have to be on a lactose-free diet because that doesn't seem to be the issue. We haven't looked at FODMAPs, if I haven't mentioned that, uh, which is a tough one to eliminate, a tough group of foods. We talked about probiotics, uh, VSL3s, I'll show you that as an interesting one. We don't know what the right one is. Pre prebiotics, which I think is going to be part of the future of this condition and maybe in gastroenterology, those are the soluble fibers that feed the good bacteria, prebiotics. So each one of those feeds a different group of bacteria. And one day, I have a feeling people will get mixed pro prebiotic mixtures rather than throw probiotics at them, just a thought. There's botanicals, many of them, many of them. A couple of them I, are mentioned here. Everyone seems to feel it's a big issue to, to somehow factor in mind, body, and lifestyle, and stress management. It seems to fit very well here with Ben, and there's all kinds of approaches to that, um, from, from mindfulness meditation to some of those like CBT, ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy. It's like CBT with meditation. It's a s simple way to say it. Some of those other therapies. Acupuncture can be very effective for some. And some people, even in integrative medicine, will start a pharmaceutical, sometimes empirically, to treat the SIBO. We'll ask Dr. Chan about that. So what are the next steps for him? Um, I think education's big. And this was a big educational session because Ben is a smart guy, and he was told what he has. And I'm trying to say, I don't think you have it. And we'll have to think about how bad gluten is for you, because it has been an enemy. And that's a big thing to tell someone, and you better be sure, we better be sure we know what we're saying there and where it, where it fits. Um, we started a couple of supplements, which I'll ask him about. I think we need a consultation with a motility expert, so I invited him to Grand Rounds, Dr. Chan, because that's the only way to get an appointment. He's very busy. Um, but honestly, uh, that would be a start. And that's a fun part about this today. They've never met. And uh, it'll be interesting to see in 10 minutes if Dr. Chan can get, get started in a few minutes uh, on his consultation. I think he needed a mind-body stress consult, and we got that with Dr. Paulson, who will be speaking. And I think he's going to need a nutritionist, uh, and, I'll, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, the education part, a lot of people love to see these slides. They're shocked to see. They wonder why they look here and here. Why is it killing me in these two places? This must be, I must be dying to have such pain in these two spots when they see the hairpin turn in the large bowel there. And if both of those are in spasm, they wonder why they look six months pregnant. There may be other theories for why that distension takes place. They also see as you go down the colon, uh, if you're cramping up at the bottom, you're going to have constipation. If you're going crampy at the bottom, it's diarrhea. Same problem, same disease, totally different symptoms. Because uh, if you really don't know much about that, this sounds like crazy. Something really bad is happening. I may die. This probably crosses people's minds. Um, we decided to talk a little bit about testing. There's a lot of testing done. I wanted to just think about celiac. I thought it was negative. It was so ingrained, I said, if we got the genetic testing and it's negative, I could say celiac is off the, off the page forever. It turned out we did celiac testing. Might have wasted the money on that. And I'll show you the results. Um, diet testing is going to be a big one. We already tested for wheat. He's tested for, gluco uh, for lactose, maybe something to do with fructose. Many alternative guys use these IgG 
mediated food sensitivities. If anyone here has ever had that, you check off, you go and have blood taken. They sample about 62 types of foods and you s turn out to be sensitive to about 28 of them. It's a big list. It's kind of, I think, semi-bogus uh, in that it doesn't seem to correlate very well. I'll tell you about some evidence to suggest otherwise. A comprehensive digestive stool analysis, a big one, an alternative in integrative medicine where your stool is sent off in something like 30 or 40 subparticles and all kinds of observations are made. I'm not clear what's gotten from that uh, in addition to what we're going to talk about now, but maybe when we're stumped, it sounds like a good test. Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth has, has happened. Has, it's become an overgrowth in the last 10 years. It's really popular. Where does that fit? The celiac testing that I did was the DQ2, and it, it's a you know, human leukocyte antigen HLA testing, the genetic test, because if you don't have it, it's off the table. He has a, a equivocal low level of, of some antibodies, and the result pr that came back with the printout was does not have low, low, low probability of celiac, which I think we already knew, not impossible that he will develop at some time in his life. So that didn't help us that much. I was looking for a home run to say never, it's never going to happen. He already has the tissue transglutaminase, IgA positive, and at the bottom, the, do the gold, gold star is positive, is, n is normal, meaning he does not have celiac disease. Um, that was about all the testing I wanted to do. This is the one paper that's referred to all the time uh, for why IgG-mediated food testing can be helpful. They basically, this guy Atkinson wrote a paper in which he tested everybody, and then he used that list of sensitive uh, foods to see if he could uh, control the condition, and he did it in a randomized, blinded uh, form. In other words, after you did your test, you were told, this is what you shouldn't have. And some of the things that you shouldn't have for some of the patients were the things that lit up. Uh, and it, he kept everybody in the dark, and it looked like it was helpful. Maybe it is. I think it's just as easy to think about what foods bother you, and let's stop them, and then re-challenge. Um, and finally, there's the FODMAP challenge. I haven't mentioned it yet, have I? Fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. This is quite a, an interesting group of foods. This group of foods are many of the best carbs and, and complex carbs. Uh, if you look at the high FODMAP foods that you will be asked to avoid, uh, artichokes, asparagus, uh, I mean cabbage, fennel, broccoli, all of some of the best you know, cruciferous vegetables, and you go down that list, you can't have honey, but you can't have sugar, sucrose. The bottom line for this one to me, and I, again, Dr. Chan might have some words to say, is where does this fit? I see it as a giant elimination. You, s you go on this low FODMAP diet, and then you slowly re-enter quickly back into the real world of eating. And one of the interesting things about this diet is it's really probably not very good for our intestinal microbiome. It does not give many prebiotics, so I think it's going to become more and more controversial as years go by, and we're going to find ways to do it simply and quickly. Uh, two things, so I said to Ben, let's try a probiotic. It seems to be an easy way, to, good way to start. Gave him VSL-3, it's a good one. Nobody knows what the best one is. Everybody says theirs is the best, of course, but I don't know the best one. This is a pretty good, high quality one, pretty potent. Um, I also decided to pick two botanicals. I'm just gonna say a couple more things and I'm gonna shut up. Uh, I gave him enteric coated peppermint, which is very interesting as an antispasmodic. You can see it comes in those, this particular brand, IB Guard. Those little tiny pills dissolve once they're down in the duodenum or further because it's such a relaxant to the gut when it's working properly that some people will get reflux if they just take peppermint oil. They gotta get these beads, something enteric coated. Tried that. And the second thing we decided to try, and we'll find out in a few minutes how that's working out, is Iberogast. It's uh, Iberis is the first herb, Iberis something, and there's seven others. This mix has been used all over the world for 30 years or so, and it's been remarkably successful in just calming the symptoms of irritable bowel. I like to do things that I don't think are gonna do any harm and make some sense. So what have we done? Uh, maybe I should have Ben come, come here. We have our patient Ben here. Give it to you. I'm going to ask Ben now, um, what do you think? I tried, uh, we tried VSL-3, uh, that, how was that? Um, you might want to use that, yeah. That uh, VSL-3 worked very well, immediately after we tried it, I stopped having, I still had some problems, but it, the pain was definitely lesser than it used to be, much less pain still. So, and are you still taking it? Twice a day, okay. Because we said, we discussed maybe we can go up to, f up to four a day. 
see what it does for you, whether it helps. So that was useful. Then I gave you enteric-coated peppermint, that, that, um, that, green, that green box there. He's smiling. What happened? <laughs> everybody here, by the way, is that on? Yeah. You may want to turn that off. Okay. I hadn't heard of that, and I'm sorry. I don't, we, doctors don't like to hurt people, but um, it did the opposite that enterocoded peppermint is supposed to do. One take-home possibility from that is maybe a tiny, tiny dose will work, but we'll see. I don't think he's going to buy that with great enthusiasm. We've got Ibrogas is a hard one to give someone that's working with very disturbed, angry, sometimes angry or aggressive uh, people and it's a it's a glass bottle and it's an alcohol based tincture and you don't really have a place to take it I mean hide it at work so how uh, I, no I don't <laughs> you know so how did that work out um, <clears throat> I've taken it uh, religiously for a couple of days here and there um, the hardest part is that it does not taste very well at all <laughs> so taking it in water is not usually the most fun thing in the world so I've been trying to take it with different types of uh, fruit punch drinks uh, the problem with that is that they are usually gone quite quickly because I like fruit punch. Um, <laughs> so I just kind of need to start trying to buy that more in bulk before I can uh, continuously take it. So it's, a, it's in progress, the, the <laughs> Ibra guest. Okay. Um, did we, uh, let's see, we talked about, I think the education part too is a long discussion about getting us to the point to think that maybe I don't have celiac disease. I think you were relieved. Well, t what'd you think when you heard that? Um, Besides that I might be crazy. Well, actually, I was very relieved because I know about the genetic related issues that come along with celiac disease. And I was also a little on the angry side at the same time uh, because uh, not, not with Don, but uh, um, because I've been told this by a doctor and it was this, you know, when I was told it was uh, crap. <laughs> yeah. um, so I kind of mauled my life, my diets and everything like that after this diagnosis. And then to hear that I didn't have it, it was a relief, but I was also a little angry that I, you know, Every single day for the past couple of years, I was thinking, oh, I have celiac disease. This is not fun. Yeah. It was interesting to have that conversation and how, how easy it is to happen. And you're not a complainer and don't show up a lot and bang on the door. And I guess you took it and stoically said, okay, that's what I got. Um, so I guess I think we're done. Uh, we, we talked about one last thing. We talked about a mind-body stress management consultation. And we had that with Dr. Paulson, and he's going to speak. But... One of the things I wanted on this list, and you might now have a built-in fear of gastroenterologists, but do Dr. You know, Dr. Chan, um, Dr. Chan has, has actually not bitten anyone in years, right? And you might um, be able to tolerate a visit to him. So what we're going to do is ask him to come up and talk from his point of view. What I've, you can comment on anything I've said, and you can ask Ben any kind of questions. All right, I'll let you know. So By the way, Dr. Chan is, is, he works here in the Department of Gastroenterology and is a specialist in gastrointestinal motility disorders. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, motility disorders, a lot of the functional disorders are patients that I um, see a lot, so. That's why we share a bunch yeah, of patients. Yeah, exactly. Right? my first go-to type <laughs> we, we end up sharing a lot of patients together. I think we refer to each other quite a bit yeah. because of, of our shared interests. But, well, first of all, thank you for having me today. I, um, the, uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, hearing sort of the um, workup and uh, what Don has talked about in terms of the differential diagnosis workup of, of, of patients presenting with these uh, uh, symptoms, I, I agree with sort of um, a lot of these initial, initial approaches. I think there are a few things I, I before I ask Ben a few questions, um, a few things I want to add to the um, uh, how, how we would approach this. if. We see a patients uh, coming in with these uh, kind of symptoms. Uh, first of all, for young patient coming in with diarrhea, bloating, abdominal pain, um, in terms of rolling out what we want to roll out, other than celiac disease, any inflammatory bowel disease is another main thing we want to make sure that we roll out because uh, young patients is sort of the age group where a lot of these patients first develop symptoms from in inflammatory bowel disease. And the red flag symptoms that Don showed uh, in terms of bleeding, nocturnal symptoms, um, weight loss, a lot of those symptoms uh, would occur in patients with these conditions, such as inflammatory bowel disease. So um, uh, the initial workup 
I think was appropriate in terms of endoscopy, colonoscopy, to look for any signs of mucosal inflammation, and also um, getting biopsies from the duodenum for celiac disease. In terms of diagnosis of celiac disease, the duodenal biopsies it's really pretty much the gold standard in diagnosing it. We will look f uh, generally look for any signs of duodenal uh, uh, lymphocyte infiltration plus blunting of the villi of the duodenum as the um, uh, uh, what we look for in patients with celiac disease on these biopsies. The key point, the key thing is that uh, patients should be completely on gluten coming in for their endoscopy. If they're off gluten um, coming in for the endoscopy, there could be healing going on. These inflammation, these findings can go away. In fact, sometimes uh, in patients with celiac disease who are on uh, who are on a gluten-free diet who continue to have symptoms to have symptoms, sometimes we actually rescope re them and get biopsies to see if it's still active. Because if they're on a gluten-free diet and we get biopsies, then it looks like all the findings are gone. Then we know that the persistent symptoms are probably not from the celiac disease, but maybe from other causes. So um, uh, making sure that they're uh, on all the gluten coming in when making the initial diagnosis uh, for the biopsy is important to make sure that you're uh, you're not clouded by what they've been taking or not taking. And this actually the same thing goes for when you get the serology for celiac disease. So when you check the TTG antibody, uh, the same thing applies because patients who've been off gluten for a while, even if they have celiac disease, the, an the TTG antibody actually might turn negative. In fact, that's also another way for us to to monitor a, pa a celiac patient in terms of their disease course and how compliant they are with their diet. Uh, so um, we need to make sure that they're on the appropriate, if, if you're trying to make the initial diagnosis that they're still eating gluten when you eat it, get these blood tests or get the biopsies. And the last thing about uh, the celiac diagnosis is the genetic testing that, that was obtained. We, we really uh, rarely check for that. Um, I think Ben's case is probably one of those that I would, I would definitely do it. Uh, the reason is that the test is highly, highly sensitive. It's extremely sensitive, but it's very, very nonspecific, meaning that if you get a negative test, you're, it's basically you definitely do not have celiac disease. But if you get a positive test, it really doesn't mean anything. Uh, whether it's low level, high level, it really doesn't mean that you have celiac disease. So if you're really gonna check this test, we really only do it in people, we are pretty sure they most likely don't have it. So you're hoping for a, uh, a, a negative result in that sense. And because Ben's, because of Ben's negative uh, biopsies before, negative antibody, the pretest probability is no low enough that I think this is one of the cases. If we really want to be very definitive about it, then then we can do it. But be very careful because a positive test really does not mean anything in this in this in this using doing this test. What we're really looking for is a negative that would that would tell us something. So. Um, I am going to ask Ben a few questions. Uh, usually when I approach patients in clinic, uh, the key thing for, for us and for me in terms of evaluating someone's um, intestinal uh, GI motility is really getting into the details of the symptoms because, um, as you know, patients come in, they, they tell you they have pain, they have bloating, they have diarrhea, but it can, you know, each of these symptoms can take on many different forms, and they might mean different things. Uh, for example, someone who tells you they have diarrhea, they can just mean they have really watery stools one time a day every day, or they can mean they're running the bathroom 10 times a day. And depending on which one it is, you might manage them a little differently or think about different things. Uh, so first of all, you know, I want to ask a little bit, you a little more about the details of your symptoms. Um, in terms of the pain that you have, uh, you know, when do you generally get, get pain and what type of pain are you usually getting? So the pain, the worst, um, the worst pain that I usually have on a regular day would probably be in the morning once I wake up. Um, so it's definitely a feeling of constipation, bloating, um, and then I usually have a cup of coffee and then use the bathroom and I'll be fine. Um, so the bloating goes away, the pain usually subsides substantially or all, entirely altogether, and then it'll slowly start to build up again throughout the day. But I'm, uh, because of my job, I'm constantly moving around, so I'm either able to use the bathroom or I just don't even notice it as much. So it's definitely in the morning when I can notice it the most. I see. And then um, in terms of bowel habits, do you go to the bathroom every day? Do you have to go multiple times a day? Multiple times a day. Yeah, and, and do you generally, are they usually 
uh, kind of loose, watery stools? Are they usually more formed or? Uh, in the morning, it's definitely more uh, watery, um, not formed stools. Mm-hmm. And, and as the day goes on, they become a little more formed. Do you get any crampy pain as you as you um, as you get the 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 need to go to the bathroom? Any crampy pain of the yes, abdomen? Yes, it usually comes on um, pretty quickly, and then it's like, all right, I need to go use the bathroom, and then it goes away once I do. Sure. And and the other thing we always want to know is the association with eating. Time-wise, I mean, do you get these symptoms a lot right after you eat it, right after you eat, or soon after you eat, or uh, do soon, they... a, soon after I eat for sure. Usually, um, depending on what I'm eating, it could be half an hour to an hour. I see. And uh, the bloating that you get, uh, do you get that after eating as well, or it could be any time of the day? Um, that's a little harder to say. It's definitely in the morning I have the bloating. Um, otherwise, it can come. I think it does depend on if I've had uh, a lot of food versus a little food. Mm-hmm. Um, so like in the morning and then probably sometimes at the dinner, I'm, I might feel bloated. Great. Um, definitely before going to bed. Sure. Um, one other thing that I'm going to ask you is in terms of historically, when did you first notice these symptoms? Did they start pretty suddenly or did they just kind of gradually that you start noticing, noticing them? Uh, it definitely started um, when I was in college, probably around my sophomore year. Um, there was pain and discomfort, and it all came on very slowly. So it took me a while to be like, oh, I should probably go to the doctor and get this checked out. But it, um, it definitely came on slowly. Okay. And, and there's no illness or anything like that that you remember prior to s- the start of it? Um, no, nothing okay. specific, no. So, so in terms of the questions I asked and, and what I'm thinking about, first of all, the, I asked about the history. Uh, the reason I asked about the onset is um, for a lot of motility or functional disorders, one of the very common causes that we see is people having a post-infectious type uh, change in motility or developing functional disorder after an infection. So people can, can catch any sort of GI tract infection, whether it's a bacterial or even a viral infection. And even after they recover from the infection, uh, their motility or um, sensitivity is altered as a result of the infection. So the most common cases we see are people who have post-infectious IBS who develop these symptoms after they have an infection. And sometimes they may even tell you that, oh, I caught us in a bug and it seems like I never got better. Uh, when you know the infection actually got better, it's just their functional or, or dysmotility, functional symptoms of dysmotility kind of linger on. Most of these patients actually over time would get better, but the length of time can vary. Sometimes it might take a few weeks, sometimes it might take a few months. And in more severe cases, I've seen patients who continue have to have some symptoms, uh, different level symptoms for many years. Uh, so, um, and that's one of the reasons why I'm trying to uh, figure out if that could have been one of the triggers for your symptoms. Now, in terms of the symptom characteristics, um, uh, getting a, an, an idea of the characteristic and timing of the symptoms is important, uh, especially when, it, when uh, in relations to food. Ben told me that a lot of these cramping, pain, and diarrhea happen soon after eating. And a lot of times what we see, we do see that quite a bit in people with diarrhea predominant IBS symptoms. And and the physiology behind it is thought to be related to a heightened gastrocolic reflex. So in in um, in regular healthy individuals, whenever we eat, uh, when, when food gets to your stomach, uh, it triggers gastrocolic reflex where it's uh, the stimulation of the stomach actually send a signal to the colon and basically make it to start move, almost like making room for food to come down. Generally, in most individuals, we don't feel that. It's a very light reflex, small movement. Um, but that's also one, one of the reasons why some people feel like after eating, they feel like they need to use the bathroom. It's because of this gastrocolic reflex. In some IBSD patients, they act, this whole reflex actually get really, really heightened. So as soon as they eat, they have a very high reflex. They start getting really crampy, significant urge. They have to run to the bathroom and often will have diarrhea or loose stools. And, um, and this is actually very common in, in IBSD patients. And in, in patients who have symptoms like this, one of the ways to treat it is to use an antispasmodic agent prior to their starting their meals so that you're suppressing that reflex 
as they eat to help decrease a lot of these postprandial symptoms. And, and, and so that's one of the reasons why I always want to characterize symptoms um, according to uh, when you eat um, and, and the timing of, of, of eating. Um, and the other thing uh, that, that I want to, uh, that, that's um, interesting to note in terms of eating is, you know, people, who, we encounter a lot of patients who get a lot of bloating after eating. I don't know if you know the symptoms like that, but um, a lot of times people have postprandial bloating. And um, that could be due to a number of different things. It could be due to the food that you eat itself causing it. In, uh, it, sometimes it could be related to a poor motility, a poor emptying of the stomach, leading to bloating after eating. And, and then now there's a, 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 some newer theory that it might be related to a change in abdominal musculature uh, after eating, leading to distension of the stomach, and people can have a lot of bloating or distension of the stomach after eating. And those are, and, 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 and that's why I asked about some of these symptoms related to eating itself. And um, uh, each of these I can actually go on and talk about in a full lecture. So I'm not going to uh, sort of go into some of the details of this, and, and maybe we can talk about it later uh, during our discussion part. Um, but uh, uh, in terms of bowel habits that, that, that you're telling me, it seems like you're going to the bathroom throughout the day with pain and bloating. So uh, as Don talked about, bacterial overgrowth and change in um, bacteria in the intestine is also something that we have to consider in patients, commonly patients coming in with these type of symptoms. And uh, um, just a couple words on the bacterial overgrowth part as we, as we talk about the, the, a lot of times the classic symptoms that, that you read about that people talk about is, oh, patients come in with bloating and diarrhea. Um, it's actually not a hundred completely true because patients can have any type of changes in bowel habits associated with bacterial overgrowth, whether it's diarrhea or constipation. And I've had a number of patients that come in that have actually more constipation predominant symptoms associated with bloating and gas that turn out to be bacterial overgrowth. So um, uh, regardless of whether it's diarrhea or constipation, that's always something that we have to consider, especially coming people coming with a lot of bloating and gas, and symptoms that are very similar to irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and the, the test that we generally do, what we think about bacterial overgrowth, is the most common one we do is electrolose breath tests. And the way this is done is that we basically give the patient a small dose of electrolose, and um, and after they, they uh, drink the lactulose, we, we basically get a, ba we have to have them breathe and get a baseline level of breath, hydrogen, and methane level at baseline, and then we keep checking it every 10 to 15 minutes for about two hours. What we want to see is the change in your breath, hydrogen, and methane level. The thought is that when this lactulose get to your, your intestine, when it gets metabolized by certain bacteria in your intestine, it's going to release hydrogen and methane. And depending on when you start seeing this rise in methane and hydrogen, we will see whether or not uh, you have bacterial overgrowth. Normally, uh, in normal individuals, the bacteria within our small bowel generally should not cause a rise in hydrogen and methane level. The bacteria in our colon would lead to a high level of methane and, uh, and hydrogen. So, you know, several hour, a couple hours after you drink the lactulose, if you keep checking the breath, it will expect to, it will be expected to be higher because the lactulose has reached the colon. The colon bacteria metabolizes it. But if you start seeing a rise in these levels in 30 minutes, 45 minutes, then you're suspecting something, some bacteria in the small intestine that could be causing it. So that's one. That's the way we we test for it. Um, the, uh, the 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 problem with this test is that because we're just judging it by timing, a lot of factors can go into it. So this, the sensitiv sensitivity and specificity of this test is actually around 60 to 70 percent. So it's not the most accurate test. Um, and if patients have very, very suggestive symptoms, even if they test negative, sometimes we might still decide to treat them because of the low sensitivity of this test. Uh, we, unfortunately, we don't have better alternative. Uh, the only other alternative is we do an endoscopy and go all the way in the small intestine, take samples, and try to, try to uh, 
grow them in the lab, but obviously it's, it's a lot more invasive to do that. We'll have a chance to get some more from Dr. Chan in a couple of minutes. Now, Dr. Paulson, who has seen Ben once, and was, Ben was very interested in dealing with the stress and stress management. So I'll let you take over, and then we'll all talk. Okay. Uh, that way. Okay. Um, please raise your uh, hand if the um, other way. No, go, keep going. I was gonna, there, you go. there we go. Okay. Raise your hand if I'm not audible. I can't uh, hear what I'm saying. Um, so Ben and I have had one conversation, and um, these were some of the things we covered. Um, one of the things about a mind-body consultation at the OSHA Center is we're sort of trying, in a sense, implicitly and explicitly to deal with the, uh, the worry that some people have that it's all in their head uh, when they're coming to see a psychiatrist or a mind-body person. And uh, clearly, I think that's not uh, Ben's uh, feeling about it. I, d I do, uh, one question I wanted to ask you at the outset that I don't think we covered when we talked, Ben, is um, what is your, uh, what is your theory? What is your sense of what, um, what the gut's doing or how, how, do, how does it, how do you, how do you think about it? What does it represent? I'm sorry, can you repeat that question one more time? <laughs> uh, what, what is your sense of what the, um, these gut symptoms represent to you? How do you characterize them to yourself? Um, I mean, of late, uh, stress has been a big thought to it, and mm -hmm. then also just uh, the medical aspect with the food of mm -hmm. what I eat. So it's kind of all over the place how I feel about it, to yeah. tell the truth. Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the things that many of you may know is that there are, uh, in fact, more serotonin receptors in the gut than there are in the brain. Um, so we often have this kind of uh, complex uh, emotional uh, frustration uh, relationship to gut-related symptoms that uh, we don't really feel any sense of control over, but they do, they do speak loudly. It's like almost having a foreign uh, um, body in our bodies which, which um, erupts sometimes, doesn't at other times, but it, the feeling is... Uh, uh, how can we uh, learn to speak a language that's uh, understandable with these symptoms? Um, the, uh, as has been said, I think the, the thing we established is it doesn't uh, feel like there is a um, stress-related causal relationship that's very clear. There may be a general climate of stress, but one thing we noted when uh, we talked is that during this uh, long hike on the Appalachian Trail, uh, which uh, for much of the time I think was, um, was a state of relaxation and pleasure for Ben, the symptoms were still there. So in that sense, um, not clearly a one-to-one -one relationship with uh, uh, acute stress and these symptoms. Um, what I remember from our conversation is that they were uh, le led largely to a sense of frustration and um, there was uh, little that had, f uh, there, there were some things with the uh, remo removal of gluten and the trial of the, the um, probiotics that seemed to be uh, offering some hope uh, for him to be able to uh, uh, gain some uh, relief from them. He's also found out his father had a similar uh, period in his um, adolescence, uh, but it seems like the father's um, experience was shorter uh, and less uh, you know, less complex than Ben's. Um, sort of, I think the, the thing that struck me was that the symptoms are kind of regarded as, uh, as an intrusion or kind of an enemy of disruption uh, rather than any kind of a, uh, a signal that's been, been of use. Uh, I think the one thing uh, that you said during the, our interview was that Maybe sometimes when the symptoms are bad, it's a signal to take a time out, and that your coworkers uh, will often understand that, and you'll you'll uh, you know take a time out to cope with them. Some things I've wondered about since we talked is the the uh, mention of ADD and uh, use of Zoloft uh, as a treatment, and as we know, Zoloft is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, and uh, I don't yet know. It would be a question. 
maybe for now, whether that dose of Zoloft has been raised or lowered, and is it have there, have there been any s change in the symptoms from? Well, uh, the Zoloft I actually use for anxiety. Right. Um, and when I first went on Zoloft, I think it was um, about two years ago, or, or a year and a half ago, I can't remember which one, and I was on a 25 milligram tablet, and last November I went up to a 50 milligram tablet. And things really, stomach-wise, things really did not change at all. Okay. And anxiety-wise? Uh, uh, definitely got better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one of the things about, you know, monitoring the Zoloft and monitoring these symptoms is to see whether at some point, as uh, perhaps the ADD gets better, I, I think you mentioned during our talk that Ritalin was one medication that you had taken in the past that helped. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, okay. So some some question remaining uh, is whether uh, there will be some correlation or some some linkage between the symptoms of ADD getting better and these uh, um, uh, gut symptoms improving. It's just sort of a question for the for the future. Um, so Ben has a lot of strengths, um, and I characterize some of them here. He he loves his work. He's in a field that he really enjoys. Uh, he's going to get a master's degree, uh, hopefully, um, and uh, you know struggles with some tests, but really enjoys uh, having had significant impact on really severely uh, disturbed kids uh, with autism and a whole variety of spectrum disorders. Um, He's got a, a good social network and makes steady, sturdy relationships, reciprocal. Um, he has a capacity for introspection. Uh, we just touched lightly on the fact that he has a, a psychotherapist that he really enjoyed kind of uh, sorting things out with, talking with. And that's, you know, in a, in a Osher-based uh, mind-body consult, that speaks volumes to me. It's not something I usually even need to go into at, at length. but. Um, uh, then I happened to ask my wife, had she ever heard of this guy? And he's really a very good uh, therapist, and Ben will hopefully get back to him when he gets his insurance changed. Um, so um, that uh, the the capacity to be alone, to enjoy hiking, to uh, you know uh, experience himself is are also very. They're all positive signs in terms of a the resources that someone has to, um, to manage a, a complicated uh, physical symptom. So um, what we did in our uh, brief meeting is something I've taken to doing over the last year and a half is I've realized that when discussing meditation or uh, stress reduction modalities, uh, in a sense, we can talk till we're blue in the face, but if we don't actually try some in the office, uh, we're, we're left with kind of theoretical uh, intellectual notions. So what we did is what I've taken to doing. We take, a, I take out my uh, insight timer on my phone and we do a three minute breathing space meditation, uh, which Ben and I did. It's uh, basically a brief Vipassana kind of meditation with the body still focusing on the breath, trying to bring the attention to the natural breath um, you, I use an image for that, a uh, bird on the water, and uh, there's a sense of um, creating an observation platform in somatic experience to, to notice how uh, rapid the thoughts move away from the point of attention. Ben said it took about an, a minute and a half to settle into doing it, but his report afterwards that his stomach felt at peace, uh, kind of peaceful, that was a good uh, a good sign it, it felt like the meditation was much shorter than it actually was and so I was left with the notion that maybe at our second uh, consult which hopefully we'll do we might make one together have him get out his phone because he's often using his uh, earbuds at, when he's hiking and uh, just have him have a, an accessible five minute three to five minute meditation he liked it better than other attempts he'd had because he could see it fitting in with the work day that he has, um, the short um, sort of uh, meditation that he might try twice a day. Um, he also mentioned that he almost uh, went into uh, Berkeley School of Music and that his, um, his, way, his, his specialty is the drums, so he's a good man with rhythm 
And uh, I'm wondering if at some point as, this, as these physical symptoms get better, he'll feel like he's getting control of this uh, colonic rhythm and uh, will become more of a uh, able, able to sort of be the uh, rhythm setter in the, um, uh, in the uh, jazz group that is his body. So um, that's basically uh, the mind-body report. Uh, I think using the uh, three-minute meditation, I suggested Ben try that over the next few weeks until we meet um, to see if it can gradually increase the parasympathetic tone, that sort of the, you know vegetative calming tone uh, uh, over against the uh, fight-flight kind of sympathetic tone. Thanks. We have about seven minutes, and I wanted to have a chance for the audience to ask any of these people, Ben or his now his team of consultants, uh, anything about this. And, and Helen has a question. Um, thank you for a wonderful um, presentation, all of you. Um, I have a question about uh, caffeine, and uh, I'm curious about um, the, the caffeine history. So it was mentioned at the beginning that you had stopped coffee for a while and your symptoms improved, but then it sounds like you're now having, still having coffee. Can you say how, how much caffeine you have and whether it has anything to do with it? Uh, yeah, so when I first got told that I had celiac disease, I was still drinking coffee for about a month afterwards and I was still having some problems. It was suggested to me, um, I think it might have been by my doctor, to cut out caffeine. So I did cold turkey, one of the hardest things I've ever done. Um, but eventually, I believe when I started doing the current work that I do now, I uh, slowly started drinking coffee again, and I realized it had no change in how my stomach felt at all. Um, so currently, I drink about maybe three cups of coffee a day, average, uh, spread out between when I wake up until about 11 o'clock. That's currently. Can I just ask Dr. Chan, do, do, would you comment on that? Is coffee a big issue for you? Well, so it really depends on the symptoms. I mean, yeah. some people who have um, uh, diarrhea symptoms, crampiness, um, ca caffeine can be a problem because uh, it can induce a lot of these uh, crampiness. That's why a lot of people, you know, in the morning they drink coffee and then they are able to go to the bathroom afterwards. If they, especially if the symptoms are diarrhea based, I'll be very careful with the caffeine. Um, also, if there's a lot of upper symptoms that, that might be related to stomach or acid, caffeine is a big inducer of uh, gastric acid. So we need to be careful. It could be inducing some GERD-type symptoms or dyspepsia symptoms in the stomach that may contribute to the pain as well. Um, Dr. Chen, I was wondering if um, you could comment on antibiotic history and how, and how that sort of, um, you know, do, do you take an antibiotic history of patients and how that might contribute to some of the symptoms yeah. that he may be I, I definitely do, and I think I definitely take the antibiotic history mostly in relation to um, their symptoms, whether they were on a course of antibiotics prior or immediately prior to symptom onset, or after they started the symptoms, if they had to take antibiotics for any reason, does that make a change to the symptoms? Uh, for example, with people who have bacterial overgrowth or change in bacterial microbiota, if they say, well, I took a course of um, you know, antibiotics for some upper airway symptoms, and my stomach was feeling fine afterwards. That may also suggest more of a change in my, uh, microbiota in the, in the intestine or bacterial overgrowth as the cause. So I, I would try to get that part of history in that context to see if that made any difference. Just one thought about the uh, caffeine question. Um, it might well be that in, since Ben has some degree of ADD that uh, a mild stimulant in the morning may help him approach his work in a more organized way so that if it's not causing adverse physical symptoms, it might be a desirable part of a kind of non-pharmacologic management of attention. Yes, I'm a dietitian at the Nutrition Wellness Service here, so I saw that line about nutritionists, and I had a couple questions for Ben, and I know you have your team over there at the OSHA Center, but uh, when I'm counseling patients, I often look at what I call spacing and pacing. And I was curious of Ben, if he's a fast eater or a slow eater. That's what I mean by the pacing. And the spacing, there's some 
um, I won't get too technical, and Dr. Chan and company, the MMC, the Migrating Mo Motor Complex, if I'm remembering right, and so works more in a fasting state, and so people that eat very uh, constant grazers or eat very frequently may feel more symptomatic. So I was curious of your pacing and spacing, as I refer to it. Uh, when I eat, I do eat quite fast. Um, Less than 20 minutes? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, and pacing throughout the day, I, I generally do have something small in the morning, usually fruit or Cheerios. Um, and then around 11.30, I'll have my lunch, and then I usually don't eat again until I get home and it's dinner time. So. Uh, yeah, it's a couple of hours apart then, yeah. That sums it up pretty well, yes. <laughs> The pace of eating. Um, one of the issues people develop symptoms if they eat really fast. There are a couple, especially uh, depending on the symptom, there are a couple of different reasons. One is air swallowing. So if people who eat fast, if they have a lot of bloating symptoms afterwards, it could be due to subconscious air swallowing as they as they really try to eat food very quickly, and and that could be one of the reasons we're worried about. The other thing is uh, is um, the gastric accommodation because when we eat. Um, and food gets in the stomach, the stomach needs to sort of expand and accommodate food. And a lot of times you eat really quickly and you really stretch out your stomach, uh, that can really actually lead to a lot of, a lot of uh, discomfort and pain as well. So, I mean, that's something that we would be careful about in patients, who have, especially if they have a lot of postprandial type symptoms. We got two more minutes, I think. Um, so hearing about Ben's work and leisure activities, it strikes me that stress really could play a, a, quite a strong role in this. Um, because even you know when you're hiking, even if your mind is at ease, if you feel like you're enjoying it, um, there still is quite a lot of opportunity for your sympathetic nervous system to be kind of heightened, for you to be looking out for dangers, thinking, you know, trying to stay safe, and maybe to have more of that fight or flight response, even if you're feeling relaxed. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, if you've been engaging in the daily breathing, and if you've noticed that that's helped at all. Um, I started the breathing techniques just just recently, actually. But I, before that, even I was still taking a lot of deep breaths through my nose, which was definitely helping a lot, and um, which made me feel a lot more comfortable. And um, although, yes, you're right, my work can be quite stressful with the degree of. Uh, day-to-day -day, uh, aggression, self-injurious behaviors that I see. Um, the activities um, that you were just describing, like the hiking, um, as I was mentioned, I did hike the Appalachian Trail, and after a while, you kind of start to blank out on some of the other dangers that could be um, present during that time. And then some of the other things like climbing, which um, I do a lot of, I, um, not recently, but I usually do do a lot of climbing, and after a while, you kind of just get used to being high up on the ropes. So. Those kind of activities just add, they did start after a while just providing a source of leisure and relaxation and the other adrenaline related aspects to it just kind of phased out after a while and just became much more calming than anything else. Just stop that. One last one. I can probably talk one. Go for it. Thank you again for sharing with us this morning. I was wondering, aside from this moment right now, have you had a chance to meet with any providers together or have your providers had a chance to talk a little bit about Um, until recently, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, my, um, excuse me. Um, I would go from my primary care to the gastroenterologist, to the therapist, and back again, and things of that nature. So, no, I've never actually experienced something like this before. This is the first. Okay, we'll stop there. I just wanted to, to mention again that in November, when we have our in integrated medicine forum, Alessio Fasano, a, a world's expert on gluten, is going to give the keynote address. I'm going to mention the, the case of Ben, but he doesn't have to be there this time, uh, in a one-minute scenario just to see what his comments are. Especially I'm interested in following up on just how important celiac, uh, I mean uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity is. Where does it fit for Ben? How much do you have to worry about it? Because it's been, it's been a really intense focus to be completely gluten-free. Maybe you don't have to be as gluten-free. Um, which would be nice if you uh, if you believe it and it works. And we'll, anyway, we'll get some more advice. It might be interesting for those who are coming to. You already know part one. 
Uh, thank you all for coming. This has been unrehearsed and pretty, pretty good. I really appreciate all of you. And we, across the hall, there's a low FODMAP uh, food <laughs> presentation, I believe, and there's coffee. What's that?